Ladies and gentlemen, on my watch it's 2.50, so we are going to start the talk by Simeon Philip, EMS Price talk by Simeon Philip from Chicago. Uh, uh, Simeon Philip, having won two medals and International Mathematical Olympiads, he studied at Princeton, Cambridge, Chicago, and he received a Clay Fellowship, which he divided between Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton and Harvard. Um, since 2019, she is a professor at Chicago University. His research connects geometry, in particular, algebraic geometry and dynamics. The EMS Prize is awarded to Simeon Philip for breakthroughs that have advanced the understanding of the geometry and the dynamics of modular spaces. He uh, sort of ingeniously uh, drew the ideas from Hodge theory and dynamical systems. He resolved a string of major conjectures in the field. In particular, he proved that orbit closures appearing in the celebrated rigidity theorem of Eskin, Mirzakami, and Mohammadi are quasi projective algebraic varieties. He established a version of Delin semisimplicity for the Hodge bundle over every orbit closure. And uh, jointly with Eskin and Wright, he extended the rigidity results of Eskin and Mirzakhani to uh, equivalent action of the natural flat bundle of over the modular space. So I could continue, but I don't do. We are much more interested to listen this talk on discrete monodomic groups and Hodge theory. I want to tell to everyone that the talk is for 40 minutes and you can put your questions on the question and answer uh, on, on your Zoom window. So please, Simeon. Thank you so much for this very generous introduction. Um, and um, I also want to thank the organizers of the ECM for putting together this event and uh, to express my regrets that I can't be present in Puerto Raj today. I would very much have liked to do, be there, but uh, we all know the circumstances. And I also want to thank the uh, scientific committee and uh, all the committees that uh, led to me receiving this prize and for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about my work here. So um, what I'll speak about today is uh, a collection of several theorems uh, that are kind of more recent that are not uh, 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 mentioned in the, in the prize work, but which have to, uh, again, relate some questions in geometry and dynamics with uh, Hodge theory. And in particular, I explain, I'll explain a little bit how um, the pictures that you can see here on the first slide, so uh, for example, these pictures, um, how they can be obtained from um, some families of algebraic manifolds and how you looking at them for dynamical eyes, you can uh, discover some rather interesting structures. So um, let me begin by um, stating and explaining three theorems. At first, uh, it might seem that they're not uh, quite related to each other, uh, even though they talk about the same objects, but as the talk progresses, I hope to make it transparent that there is um, a relation between all of them and uh, some logical coherence, uh, even though the objects are looked at from very different points of view. So the first result is a theorem with sharp run and it's a rather uh, elementary to state theorem. Uh, it's just about matrices, four by four matrices. So I, I will start with these uh, two matrices. One I'm going to call R and the other one I'm going to call U. And you see the entries uh, here. Uh, I'm using some abbreviations just to fit everything on one slide. So C1 and C2 are some cosines that depend on this parameter n, which is at least four. And I'm going to consider their image uh, in a their action on projective space. So I'm going to take their projectivization. They happen to lie in a symplectic group. So that's why 
uh, here it says the projective bisymplectic group. Um, the form of this matrices uh, is such that you can easily compute their characteristic polynomials. So uh, this is what's called a companion matrix. And so uh, the relation that R to the N is equal to one uh, can be seen uh, from that and the expression C1 and C2. And so the first theorem is simply that if you take the group generated by these matrices, uh, then you get a group that's isomorphic to this uh, essentially free product. The content here is that there's no other relations between uh, these matrices. So as you multiply them, you're not going to obtain any new relations other than the ones that you uh, already see. So um, the fact that, as I said, R to the N is equal to one uh, follows from just the formulas that I gave initially, but the claim is that there are no other relations. More importantly, uh, the, the other claim is that this group is in fact a discrete subgroup of the symplectic group. So this is, uh, I hope, even less obvious because uh, these cosines in general, as N gets large, they will, uh, give you algebraic numbers. And so if you start multiplying these matrices, there's no obvious reason why uh, these algebraic numbers won't start getting denser and denser in the symplectic. So um, these are the two assertions about the group generated by these two matrices. So uh, the statement uh, and the conclusion, so the assumptions and the conclusions are quite elementary, uh, but as a matter of fact, somehow, when you work with linear algebra, it can be quite, tricky to establish even a very elementary statement. So I'll explain uh, a bit more about how we obtain this. Uh, and I should say that this first theorem is joint with Charles Fourgeois. The next theorem that uh, I want to explain is, again, on the face of it, seemingly unrelated to the previous one. And it is the following. So I consider a differential operator that I call dn um, in one variable, so it's an ordinary differential equation that uh, we get. And I'm going to use this abbreviation that's standard in the theory. Uh, that's Z DZ. So it's, it's a slightly modified derivative. And uh, it's a differential operator of order four with polynomial coefficients. So if you expand the expression that I wrote here, you'll get uh, at most fourth order derivatives. And in front of them, uh, you'll have a coefficient, which is going to be a polynomial in Z. So it's a equation, ordinary differential equation with polynomial coefficients. Of course, I want to look at it uh, in the complex plane. So Z is a complex variable. And the parameters alpha that um, I'm going to use are uh, the following. So you, you see them here, it's four, four numbers. Uh, they should maybe uh, ring a bell. Uh, if you remember from the previous slide, we had some cosines that uh, looked or involved similar kinds of numbers. Um, again, here n is at least four. And um, the assertion is one about the solutions of this differential equation, but uh, if, two particular solutions. And so I didn't write them out explicitly because they would uh, yield some rather complicated expressions, but uh, this differential equation is uh, a differential equation of hypergeometric type. So, um, if you've heard of it, uh, that's great. If not, then um, as I mentioned earlier, you can expand it and obtain a differential equation with polynomial coefficients, and you can try to solve it in power series, uh, let's say around the origin. And the first solution is a classical function, uh, which, so here I'm using uh, an abbreviation. So this alpha k denotes the product alpha, alpha plus one, and so on alpha plus k minus one. So uh, this is what this abbreviation means. And um, so we have a product of uh, four things that look like a factorial and here k factorial to the fourth. So we get a power series, which uh, you can verify it will satisfy this differential equation. And then there's another one um, that involves some logarithmic terms and, and that um, I didn't write all the terms, but it will involve something that looks closely related to the power series I wrote here, but uh, as I said, there would be some algorithmic corrections. In general, I should say this is a differential equation of order four. So uh, if you try to solve it in power series, you'll find that there are four in linearly independent solutions, but some of them become multi-valued near the origin. This is essentially the unique single-valued uh, 
holomorphic uh, solution near the origin. Uh, this one has only one simple ambiguity that comes from the fact that the logarithm in the complex plane near the origin is not uniquely defined. So it has, uh, you see here, the phenomenon of monodromy. But so I'm considering only these first two solutions. And uh, what I uh, cons consider now is the Ronskian, which is uh, basically the two by two determinant where I take the functions and the de their derivatives. And uh, the assertion is uh, an assertion about analytic functions, but it says that this analytic function never vanishes, but not just uh, in some neighborhood of the origin, but rather uh, on the universal cover of the space where this function is well defined. So uh, as I was saying, there's zero, there is one, there's also the point at infinity. And so this differential equation, uh, if you write out the polynomials that define it, uh, you'll see that you can solve it in power series around any point that's not zero, one, or infinity. And there will be unique holomorphic solutions. When you're around one of these singularities, you get what's called the regular singularity. And uh, this regular singularity you know, leads to solutions uh, like the ones I wrote here. So here I was expanding them around zero. So anytime you have a solution, let's say in this region over here, and you have a family of solutions, if you analytically continue them along a path in the complex plane uh, like this, you can uh, do this construction like you would do it, for example, with the logarithm. Uh, and by the time you come back, uh, to your new uh, original set of solutions, you'll get a different family of solutions. And that uh, gives you what's called the monodromy group. So these functions are honestly defined on the universal cover of the complex plane function of these three points. Uh, because um, if, uh, if you, um, as I said, go around the loop, then you get different functions. So you really have to consider them on the universal cover. So the assertion is that on this largest space on which this function is defined, uh, it never vanishes. Okay, so um, again, seemingly this is a, an unrelated statement to uh, the previous theorem. However, uh, you can see at least some of the objects that are similar to the previous one, namely, uh, there's the monodromy group, uh, which I can tell you right away, the group of transformations that the functions experience as they go around these loops is exactly the loop the group that I uh, described earlier uh, on the, in the previous year. Okay, so uh, let me now tell you the third theorem, which is one that's in dynamics. And it says that if you consider the following orbifold, uh, I'm gonna call it Yn, where I divide the hyperbolic plane uh, by the n infinity infinity triangle group. So uh, this looks something like this, you, you have, two cusps and a point of order two pi over n. So you'll have to forgive my drawing, not very accurate, but you have these two uh, points, two cusps on the hyperbolic surface and the orbifold point of order n at uh, here that I drew here. And so I'm going to consider this uh, hyperbolic surface or default. And the assertion is that uh, if I consider what's called the linear co-cycle induced by the group that I had in the first year, uh, this group gamma n, then it's Lapinov exponents, which uh, is an invariant in dynamics, which I will explain uh, later on, then they uh, satisfy the following formula that their sum, so uh, the first two exponents, lambda one plus lambda two, their sum, can be computed as the, these numbers alpha one plus alpha two, where alpha one and alpha two are again the parameters you saw in the previous uh, slide with the uh, hypergeometric equation. So uh, if you're familiar with Lapinov exponents, you might know that um, in general they're difficult to compute because they're given uh, by you know as, as a limit of some uh, almost monotonic sequence, and uh, in general it can be very hard to uh, you know a priori that that sequence has to converge, but you never can compute it precisely in dynamics. It's, it's quite rare that you can give a formula for these uh, things. And so um, the content here of the theorem is that, in fact, you can compute the sum of Lapinov exponents and that it's essentially a topological invariant rather than an analytic one, which uh, 
is what how they occur more frequently in dynamics. All right. So these are uh, the three theorems that um, I want to explain before um, giving more uh, background. So before it, talking about the proofs, I, I want to uh, say a few words about hypergeometric equations and just to give you a little bit of context. So these are, um, they depend on two families of parameters, alpha and beta. Uh, and so I wrote them over here. In general, they're of degree n. This gives us a differential operator on uh, the complex line uh, minus these three points. And it has regular singularities at all these three points, which is a notion from uh, ordinary differential equations that tells us that uh, we can have a power series with, uh, at worst, polynomial singularities at uh, these singular points. So the, the, behavior, the behavior of solutions is not too bad around the singularities. And uh, what's important uh, and the reason why we're interested in uh, these uh, hypergeometric equations is that they're monodromy, which is uh, what I was describing earlier, this picture with the singularities and starting with some family of solutions and moving it around a loop. So um, you see transformation matrices. And so maybe the simplest example of monodromy is, of course, if you take log z and 2 pi i, uh, these are two functions which solve uh, simple to write down differential equation of order 2, uh, which I uh, encourage you to do if you haven't seen this before. And they, they, so there are two solutions of that differential equation. But when I take log z and I move it around the loop around 0, it comes back moved by another solution to that same differential equation, which is uh, 2 pi i. Um, so this is a very uh, uh, large family of uh, discrete subgroups of uh, linear groups. And uh, this is an object that's well studied in uh, dynamics and in geometry of, uh, and subgroups of Lie groups. Um, a bit more generally, uh, much of uh, what I'm saying is, is also some, at least some of the theorems, uh, the theorems two and three, are valid also when you have more general, uh, what are called variations of Hodge structure, which come from uh, families of algebraic manifolds. And they tell you how the cohomology of those uh, manifolds change, or maybe from a different point of view, how integrals of algebraic differential forms, uh, you know, it's not functions you can integrate, but you can show that they satisfy certain differential equations, which um, are similar to these hypergeometric ones, but in general, uh, more complicated. So um, as I said, the solutions of these differential equations are, um, so the standard hypergeometric functions are uh, written in terms of these uh, functions, uh, not these power series where alpha k is alpha, alpha plus one, and so on, alpha plus k minus one. And um, of course, there are also, as I said, logarithmic terms, which lead to these uh, indeterminacies and in the uh, solutions and to the monodromy. And so the parameters that I'm considering in theorem one are uh, of the following shape. So they have this beta equal to 0. All, all the beta parameters, actually, I'm sorry, all the betas are not 0, but rather they're all 1, so that the way I wrote it here, you just get d to the power of 4. Uh, and all the alphas are uh, listed over here. And uh, so maybe I should say, what's the geometric meaning of this beta all being equal to 1? Uh, it simply will mean that the monodromy matrix around 0, so beta is, carries the information around 0, it will say that this monodromy matrix is a maximally unipotent matrix. In other words, it's a matrix of order four, four by four matrix, uh, so that I write, if I write one minus u to the power, uh, I want to say three is not equal to zero, but one minus u to the power four is equal to zero. So it's the largest degree uh, unipotent matrix that you can have that's four by four. Um, and so you can, if you, in other words, if you bring it to a Jordan normal form, it has a maximal Jordan block of size four. So this is the geometric meaning of 
having uh, all the betas equal to zero and uh, all the alphas as they're given here exactly tell you that the monodromy around infinity uh, will be uh, now a matrix of finite order and uh, these basically encode the eigenvalues of that finite order matrix. Okay, so uh, now I can tell you a little bit about the proof of theorem one and it's based on uh, something that's called uh, the ping pong lemma or in other words, uh, from different point of view, symbolic dynamics. Uh, so remember we had uh, the hyperbolic plane and we had this orbifold, which was um, uh, given, uh, it had a point of order pi over n, two pi over n at uh, an orbifold point and then two uh, singular points at infinity, two cusps. So in fact, uh, there's a slightly larger reflection group that uh, contains the fundamental group of that orbifold with index two, where I take the triangle group with angles two pi over two n here. And then, um, so you, you can see there, there, there's a triangle over here in the hyperbolic plane. And I take the group generated by reflections and the sides of this triangle, so I get uh, first, I get a dihedral group, but then you see when I reach one of these other triangles, I can reflect the whole picture um, across this side of the triangle, and I'll get uh, this complicated and uh, pretty picture that you get in hyperbolic planes that kind of repeats itself uh, to smaller and smaller scales. Well, the scales are smaller in this picture, but really the scale is uh, always the same in hyperbolic geometry. So um, what we show is that associated to uh, this basic fundamental domain for the dihedral group, we can construct a cone. So we, we construct a cone C. Uh, I'm going to write it in a projectivized form. That's why it's a tetrahedron. So if I have R4, a cone in R4, once you projectivize it, you get uh, some polyhedron in uh, RP3, so a three-dimensional projective space. And so that's why you see this tetrahedron. And this tetrahedron um, has a lot of nice uh, properties that go well with the group that I wrote earlier. So everything is very explicit. We can write down the, uh, the matrices uh, and the description of this cone. And so, what, once we have one cone, what we can do is, of course, we can apply the reflection group and we kind of propagate it first uh, here to one nearby side. And then we uh, keep applying it until we cover uh, essentially the whole boundary of the hyperbolic plane. And the crucial dynamical property that happens, and this is why, why it's called ping pong, is that once I apply the reflection, which takes, uh, which exchanges this hyperbolic side. Uh, this this side of the uh, boundary of the hyperbolic plane with the exterior, I will map all of these cones. If I look at the action in projective space, all of these cones except the, this one will get mapped in the interior. So if I apply that one reflection, all of those cones map into the interior over here. This is if I apply, as I said, one specific reflection, which uh, in our paper we call A, but uh, th this is kind of the, the crucial dynamical property, which of course is not easy to arrange. If I start with an arbitrary cone, there's no reason why such a thing would happen. And uh, the whole uh, game is to find the cone that has this, this jointness property. So if I rotate it, the, all these cones have to be disjoint in projective space, but also if I apply the reflection matrix, I have to land inside the original cone, which is uh, in general, uh, rather challenging and not all groups admit such a, a nice structure. Now, uh, once you have this, a picture like this, you can of course uh, ask what happens if you do this many, many times. In other words, you constructed one generation of cones. Now you apply a reflection, you will get a family of cones over here inside this one original polyhedron. Then you can rotate them and then apply it again and again and uh, again. So I'll address what happens if you keep doing this uh, in a moment. But before that, I want to say a few things about uh, the symplectic group. 
And uh, what's interesting about the symplectic group is that it's a higher rank Lie group. And as a higher rank Lie group, it has uh, several interesting homogeneous spaces on which it acts. And the ones that are of interest uh, for us, one is the space of lines in R4, so RP3, in other words, the projective uh, three space. And the other one is the space of Lagrangians in the same R4. So both of these are 13 dimensional, um, sorry, three dimensional um, real manifolds. And the symplectic group acts on them. And they're uh, what are called flag varieties. Um, there's a relation between them. Uh, so if, I, if you give me a point in, uh, let me say first, if you give me a Lagrangian, then, uh, which is in other words, a point in the Lagrangian Grassmannian that yields a line in RP4, which is simply all the uh, vectors that are contained in that Lagrangian. Conversely, if you give me one uh, point in RP4, which is um, nothing but just an array in R4, I can consider all the Lagrangians that contain that array. And that, in fact, gives me a one dimensional family of Lagrangians in the Lagrangian Grassmannian. The reason I'm calling it array here is because, um, in fact, there is a geometry in the Lagrangian Grassmannian, and it's a, a Lorentzian geometry. So it has a conformal class of Lorentzian metrics. And the arrays that you get this way are going to be null arrays for that Lorentzian geometry. So if you uh, consider the dynamics of the group that I was describing earlier, you um, get two closed sets. One, so what I was describing earlier is a closed set in uh, the projective space. And you can take its complement, uh, which would be uh, some open set. And you can also consider associated to any closed subset in the projective space, you can consider a closed subset in the Lagrangian Grassmannian, which to every point associates a ray. So, uh, Simeon, uh, is a question? Uh, yeah. Piotr Brandwein raised his hand. Yes, please. Yeah. You can ask a question. Piotr, do you want to put a question now? Yeah. Uh, I But uh, Piotr, do you want to speak or write as you prefer? Oh, he, okay, then continue. He will put the question at the end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. But if, if anybody else has any question, I'm happy to clarify it. Um, all right. So now, uh, as I was saying, if we uh, take the picture that we had previously, in other words, these cones, and we um, so we see here kind of something that starts looking like a curve, but then we apply this dynamics to the cones over and over, we're going to get the increasingly shrinking family of cones, and we're going to get uh, a limit set in RP4 that is the intersection of all of those cones. And um, then I can consider the associated set in the Lagrangian Grassmannian, which to every point in my original limit set gives me a ray. And this is what the pictures uh, at the beginning were about. So here uh, in red, in the first two pictures, you see um, that curve that I was, uh, that intersection of cones, if you keep doing it many, many times. And these two points in uh, green and in blue are basically the endpoints of that uh, segment on the unit circle. So I wrote, I, I drew only a fundamental domain for the dihedral group. Uh, I should say also that horizontally, it's pictures of the parameter n equals, I think, four. And here, the other uh, set of horizontal pictures is for the parameter, I think, n equals seven. So for each n, you get uh, one of these fractal curves in uh, projective three space, which uh, you see here drawn in red on the gray background. And associated to each curve in projective space, you have a surface in the Lagrangian Grassmannian and the surface I drew here. And again, to get a sensible picture, I intersected that surface with a sphere. So that's why it has this kind of round uh, boundary, but it's simply so that there's some kind of picture that has a scale. Uh, but the surface, as you can see from these pictures, is foliated by uh, lines. And in fact, they're null rays for a certain uh, Lorentzian structure. And so this is kind of a fractal surface. 
if you look at its boundary here, you can see that uh, its boundary, which is a curve here when intersected with a sphere, th this is much more uh, ragged, so to speak. Okay, so um, this basically uh, tells you the, the tools that are needed to prove theorem one. To prove theorem two, uh, so remember theorem two was, uh, let me just go back to the statement for one moment. Uh, so theorem two was a theorem about uh, differential equations and about power series solutions. And so I formulated in this algebraic way, just to kind of illustrate that it can be formulated in this way. But uh, in fact, it has a very uh, transparent geometric meaning uh, in terms of Hodge theory. And so um, if we go back to this um, picture of our orbifold and as I said, we, we had, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so it, we had the, this refl uh, reflection group acting on it. And um, over this universal cover, there is a, a variation of Hodge structures. So our topological data of uh, C4 with a discrete group acting on it it in fact supports also an analytic decomposition that comes from uh, Hodge theory. And uh, it's what's called the weight three variation of Hodge structures in this particular case. And these, each of these spaces is one dimensional and uh, they vary in some uh, appropriate way that has to do with holomorphic functions. So V3 zero varies holomorphically uh, of the, and as a, the way it depends on the complex parameter of the disk. And the other ones, uh, very holomorphically also in an appropriate sense if you take kind of some certain sums. Um, but then uh, the theorem has a, a geometric interpretation and it's simply the following. So remember in the Lagrangian Grassmannian, we have uh, the limit set that I call uh, L lambda n and we had its complement omega n, which uh, L omega n, or here I guess I called it just omega n, which was the complement of this uh, limit set. And so one theorem is that the group, the discrete group acts properly discontinuously on this uh, open set. So that on the complement of that fractal surface that in orange, so if you remember this, so on the complement of this surface, we have, so this surface is invariant by this large group of symmetries and its complement gives you an open set on which the action of the group is actually properly discontinuous. And the content of theorem two is actually an identification of this domain of discontinuity in terms of Hodge theory. And it's saying that you can identify it using some uh, construction uh, starting from this Hodge decomposition, what you have to do is you have to take the second exterior power representation, uh, which if you know about the Lagrangian Grassmannian, of course, to describe the Lagrangian Grassmannian of R4, you have to take the second exterior power of the R4. Uh, and then this open set omega n, if you, uh, you have an, an equivariant map and then that identification with uh, one piece, the unit vector is in one piece of the Hodge decomposition. So when you take the uh, second exterior power, uh, you don't just get a plain vector space, but you have also a Hodge decomposition like this over here, but then with Ws and uh, one piece of that uh, Hodge decomposition, if you take the unit vectors and you see, look at how that piece varies, that precisely gives you uh, an interpretation of this domain of this continuity. So this is kind of in the spirit of the uniformization theorem where uh, again, using Hodge theory, you can identify uh, the upper half plane with uh, various moduli spaces of uh, objects that can be described using Hodge theory. So here you get a similar structure, but for higher weight variations of Hodge structure. So um, this is kind of one interpretation of uh, theorem two. And I want to say just a few words also about theorem three, which kind of uses all, all of these objects. So uh, in order to explain theorem three, I have to say a little bit about what are Lapinov exponents. So um, these are invariants that come from dynamics. 
And uh, what we have to do is if you consider, for example, an ordinary differential equation uh, where V is some vector in RD, so you can, suppose you have a vector that's changing in time according to some linear equation. So V dot is a matrix that depends on T uh, and then you apply it to V. And your matrix is typically driven by some dynamical system uh, that lives over some compact uh, or finite measure space. And in that case, the Osolevitz theorem tells you that um, there's an asymptotic growth rate of these solutions. So there's the top Lapinov exponent lambda one, uh, and any solution of this, a generic solution of this ODE will grow at rate uh, lambda one. Uh, it will grow exponentially. So uh, of course, let me say if A of T were a diagonal matrix that didn't change in time, then you could read off very easily the Lapinov exponents. It would be just the diagonal entries uh, ordered by size, let's say real entries. Uh, in general, uh, this is the content of the Osiletis theorem is that even if your matrix is changing in time, you do still have an asymptotic growth rate for uh, generic starting conditions. And these growth rates are called the uh, the Lapinov exponents. So as I said, lambda one gives you the generic growth of a vector, but on the co-dimension one subspace, you'll experience slower growth given by another exponent lambda two, and it keeps going like this all the way up to the dimension. So in general, you have D exponents. Some of them might be equal, and there's no assertion here that they're all different. In fact, some of them might, all of them might be zero. For instance, if A of T is a, a unitary matrix, so what happened is, in, uh, in maybe uh, before I say this, I should say that in general, for typical dynamical systems, it can be hard to compute, even estimate the Lapinov exponents. In fact, it can be hard to show that they're positive uh, because so that, that's where a lot of the work in dynamics goes and showing that these numbers are not zero, and that they're positive, and that there is actual uh, growth. and so it was somewhat surprising when in 98, Konsevich, Maxim Konsevich found the formula for uh, the case when your dynamical system was driven by a matrix and the symplectic group. So here I wrote uh, an element of the Lie algebra because of course here the matrix A of T is, should be thought of as something in the Lie algebra that gets exponentiated. And so you have two G exponents. Now the sum of all of them, all the two G ones, this, that sum is zero. But he found the formula for the sum of the first G, which are the non-negative ones. And uh, his formula applied to any variation of five structures of weight one. So as long as you're a dynamical system, so th there's some assumptions here that I'm not uh, providing in detail, but essentially when your dynamical system was underlied some uh, variation of five structures of weight one, then uh, you could obtain such a formula that was in some sense purely topological. So. Um, the, this sum of Lapinov exponents, which are each of them individually is some analytic invariant, which is hard to compute, but their sum uh, satisfy the nice topological formula. So um, then they, uh, with Eskin and Muller and Zorich, they made a conjecture, uh, and Zorich, they made a conje conjecture that for certain variations of height structure of weight three, so uh, the weight of a variation of height structures is kind of a, an essential invariant and really determines a lot about the a lot possible behavior. And weight one is kind of a classical uh, object of study. It's uh, Riemann surfaces and abelian varieties. In general, higher weight uh, is much more mysterious from all points of view, from uh, arithmetic and uh, analytic and all other directions. And so uh, they proposed a conjecture that this formula for the sum of Lapinov exponents does hold in certain cases for weight three variations. So it doesn't always hold, in fact. Uh, this is already known that there are some obstructions for this formula holding. And um, essentially, so theorem three uh, is a, a statement where this uh, formula holds in some uh, infinite family of these examples of uh, discrete groups. So um, maybe uh, I'll stop here and I'll, I'll Thank you for listening and uh, I'll take any questions.